Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kevin Chilton, Explorer Chair for Space Warfighting Studies at the Mitchell Institute Space Power Advantage Research Center. And welcome to our Space Power Forum today. I'm really pleased to welcome Lieutenant General Sean Shaw and, and thank him for taking carving time out of his day to spend time with us. Lieutenant General Shaw is the Deputy Commander of US Space Command, not to be confused with the Space Force. U.S. Space Command is the unified combatant command responsible for conducting operations in, from, and to space to deter conflict and, if necessary, defeat aggression, deliver space combat power for the joint and combined force, and defend U.S. vital interests with allies and partners. Prior to his current role, Lieutenant General Shaw was dual-hatted as the commander of Combined Forces Space Component Command, U.S. Space Command, and the Deputy Commander, Space Operations Command, U.S. Space Force at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It's my pleasure to welcome you, General Shaw, to the forum this morning. And I think I'd like to begin by giving you the opportunity to uh, start with some opening remarks. Well, hey, good morning and happy Friday to everybody. And, and General Chilton, it's an honor to, to share a stage with you here, even if virtually. Um, thanks again for all your, uh, your, um, your mentorship and leadership uh, during the time we've known each other. Um, and uh, I, I do have to start with one question for you as you're comfortably ensconced there in Colorado Springs. Are, are we getting some snow today? There was supposed to be snow. The, the ski, I, need, I got a ski trip coming up and we need to get some snow on the slopes. Can you give me a report? There's rumors that there's snow in the mountains, but there's none here in town yet. And so uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to check the reports a little later this morning. But you're exactly right. We're hurting. We could use some snow. All right. Well. I look forward to that opportunity down the, down the road to get out on the slopes. Um, I uh, hey, so I, again, I going to be a uh, I think a great discussion today, and I look forward to it. I think I'll start by just talking about hey, where where so where are we today? You know, we've come a long way in two years. Um, it, it's been just uh, two years and a few months since we stood up the new United States Space Command, and uh, we're going to celebrate the second birthday of the Space Force next week. Uh, um, and, uh, it's, uh, and it's been quite a ride. I've been in the job here, uh, just over a year and I've already seen some tremendous change across the space enterprise as we've grown both of those, uh, um, institutions, but not only just them, but also the, uh, the integration of those into other services, other combatant commands and across the department of defense and beyond allies and partners and other parts of our, our government. So it's been exciting. I think I'll open it by saying I get this question a lot. Uh, if we have a U.S. Space Force, why do we need a U.S. Space Command? Or I get the inverse question. If we have a United States Space Command, why do we need a United States Space Force? And the bottom line up front answer is we need both. We absolutely need both. And we are only now just tapping into the potential of both of those organizations to assist in joint warfighting and protecting, defending the space domain and enabling, uh, providing enabling space capabilities for all joint warfighters. And that's my, that's my starting line. And let me talk a little bit more about that. You know, there's this great, uh, and by the way, both organizations are gonna be important and need to grow. There's this great nerdy engineering joke that goes like this. An engineer says, um, I can prove, uh, says to the mathematician, I can prove that one plus one equals three. And the mathematician is, no, you can't. The engineer says, yes, for very large values of one. Um, it drives pure mathematicians nuts. But my point of it is we need both the U.S. Space Command Space Force to have the large values of those organizations. Neither should be diminished. And both will need necessary uh, for us as we move forward. So let's talk about U.S. Space Command. So we... Uh, here's what United... So we are a combatant command. And again, for those in the audience, the that may not be uh, as familiar with how we are set up as a Department of Defense. We are one of 11 combatant commands that are joint organizations comprised of personnel from all of the military services. And those organizations, those combat commanders report directly to the Secretary of Defense and have the responsibility to conduct warfighting operations in their areas of responsibility or to support other combatant commands as necessary. It's how we're organized. The services the service chiefs do not conduct operations. They do not actually um, uh, issue uh, uh, warfighting orders. Um, they do provide all of the capabilities that the combatant bands use. So let me get a little more doctrinal even for those that are out there looking up their doctrine. 
here's what U.S. Space Command is not. It is not what we would call in doctrine a specified command. So there's a special construct in in military in our military doctrine that calls that that's described as a specified command. It is a warfighting combat command, like I described, but comprised almost exclusively of one service. Some might think U.S. Space Command is just the warfighting end of U.S. Space Force, and that would maybe fit the definition of a specified command. U.S. Space Command is not that. We need the capabilities of all of the services, and we need integration with all of the services to make sure that we are providing space capabilities to joint warfighters in the terrestrial domains, but also to leverage everything that all of the other services can bring to meet General Dickinson's missions. He's my boss as commander of U.S. Space Command to meet his missions within the space domain. For example, the Navy may have some terrific radars on some of its vessels that are capable of reaching up into uh, beyond the atmosphere and, uh, and tracking uh, objects in orbit. We can use that capability. The Army may have some sort of similar capability to conduct electromagnetic uh, warfare that could extend into the space domain. General Dickinson needs that capability. Does that mean now that U.S. Space Command has to have ownership of such of those capabilities? Absolutely not. This is how we're going to function as an integrated, globally integrated uh, department. And each uh, uh, combatant command can be in a, either a supported or a supporting role to other combatant commands. And that means there will be instances where General Dickinson, as the U.S. Space Command commander, will be a supported combatant commander. And there will be other combatant commands that may have the ownership of those ships at sea or those army units on the ground that can then support a space scheme of maneuver. And we do it together in a mutually supporting fashion. Uh, let me swing over to Space Force because that is my service. I, I, I made that transfer last year. So I, it, it was interesting, right? I actually resigned my commission in the US Air Force and accepted a commission in the US Space Force. So it was a little surreal at the time when it happened. It's, and it's been very interesting ever since. Um, do, do, do we want US Space Command to to also have the, the responsibility to organize, train, and equip the preponderance of that capability that Space Command needs, which is going to be, uh, you know, working within the domain, supplying space uh, uh, capabilities down into the terrestrial spheres, for, for providing protect and defend capabilities. Uh, the answer is no. We need Space Force to organize, train, and equip those space forces that are going to be needed to do those, those things within um, the space uh, area of responsibility. And that is a partnership between those two organizations, as well as that, uh, that connectivity to all of the other organizations that I mentioned, the other services, the other combat commands, that will get us where we need to be as a department of the, the defense and as a nation um, in protecting and defending and ensuring a, a safe, stable, and secure space to me. So let me start with that. I'm sure that could open to lots of threads of questions, General Children, but I think that's an important thing to remember. We, we have both these organizations, they're both growing, and they're both vitally important. Well, that's a great start, uh, General Shaw. And, and you're right, I, even here in Colorado Springs, which is home currently to US Space Command and to the Space Operations Command, which is part of the Space Force, there's great confusion amongst even the locals about what are the, what are the, what are the different responsibilities of these organizations, the Space Force versus US Space Command. And I think you articulated it well, the organized, train and equip function for the Space Force and the warfighting function for U.S. Space Command. And they're very different staffs and very different organizations that are required to accomplish that. You know, I believe it was General Estes back in probably 1996 was the first commander of then U.S. Space Command to ask for a change to the unified command plan to name space as an area of operations an AOR, if you will. And, and as our listeners know, you know, the Pacific Command is commanded by a Navy Admiral, a joint command. And if anything happens within his region, he's responsible for it, for conducting more fighting operations there. Same with the European Command. And now U.S. Space Command has an area of responsibility as well that begins at 100 kilometers and goes up. Can you uh, describe, you know, what's changed as a result of being given those of that, that AOR, what new authorities you feel you have, uh, organizational change you made, and maybe things that aren't quite all the way there, 
that you'd like to see us uh, move forward to make us more, make this particular command and AOR more similar to what the authorities and responsibilities a regional might have? Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I did mention, I think, the term area of responsibility earlier. So it's a great way to kind of expound on that. I actually think this is what is uh, making our situation particularly exciting to kind of to, to, to see where the possibilities take us. So uh, as you said, General Chilton, the, the former U.S. Space Command that uh, stood up mid-1980s and stood down in 2002 had a, it was known what we call as a functional combatant command. It had responsibilities to provide support to the geographic combatant commands, like you said, you know, Indo-PACOM, UCOM, those that are defined by uh, areas of responsibility on the surface of the earth. And, but the former U.S. Space Command was just a functional that was, that it was meant to give trans-regional support to all the geographics, analogous to uh, Transcom uh, Transportation Command that we have today, which has that same sort of functional responsibility. The new U.S. Space Command, U.S. Space Command 2.0, I've heard some people refer to it, that stood up two years ago in the unified command plan that the president uh, uh, signed to give responsibilities uh, had this interesting clause in it and actually assigned an area of responsibility to U.S. Space Command, and it's defined as starting 100 kilometers above uh, sea level on the planet Earth and extending upwards uh, indefinitely. Uh, that's a large, uh, that's a relatively large AOR if you do the math. Um, the, the relevant part of that AOR to us is, is getting larger all the time as well as we look further and further out uh, from the surface of the Earth. So what does that mean? That's basically the question. So what, so what, what are the implications? Well, it means that we're, we're both now both a functional combatant command and what would have been known as a geographic combatant command. Um, in a spirit of intellectual troublemaking, I've, I've used the word astrographic on occasion uh, to try to drive home the point. First of all, it's just etym uh, etymologically correct to do that, right? We're, we're not a geographic combat command because that literally means drawn on the surface of the earth. And, and that's exactly what we're not. Um, and, uh, and yet we are not a, just a functional combat command. We are responsible for an area of responsibility that in which uh, there are threats uh, where adversaries could be operating, and we have responsibilities to protect and defend capabilities that are becoming increasingly important to joint warfighters in the terrestrial spheres. So it's become an interesting, uh, that really is the core of a problem statement for us. And what does this mean and how we organize the command? What does it mean to be a supported combatant command within that AOR for those activities? And how do we grow the, the integration with other combatant commands to make that happen? Uh, but how do we also, at the same time, not lose focus on our primary uh, function, which is to provide space capability? That's why space capabilities exist, is to provide capability down to joint warfighters, to society uh, from, from the space domain. So this has become, a, a, again, a departure point for a lot of the ways we're thinking about how we need to integrate with other combat commands, what kinds of capabilities we need, and what are even our mission orders that we give to our subordinate commands look like are defined by this, this responsibility. Thank you. Um, you know, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks, um, the requirements to be supported on occasion, and you just reiterated that here. You know, if you look at a regional geographic combatant commander, they have air, land, and sea components, special operations components as well, probably cyber now as well who um, are tasked to, uh, at the operational level to integrate their operations to support one another uh, and achieve the effects that the combatant commander, the boss, wants to have achieved within their, their AOR. Um, I, I believe General Dickinson just recently named General Whiting, the Space Operations Command commander, as his space component commander. Do you envision having other component commands um, from other domains standing up under US Space Command to provide the similar kind of coordinated um, efforts you need at the operational level of war that a regional combatant commander would have? Hey, so I, well, first of all, I, and I probably should have mentioned this in open remarks, we already have assigned to US Space Command service components from all of the other services. 
So in addition to, and the one that we would all logically think the most, a Space Force com Service Component Command that's bringing an awful lot of capability to the U.S. Space Command. I don't want to diminish that. It's the lion's share of what we have uh, is coming from Space Force and that service. But we also have an Army Service Component. Uh, it, uh, today, it's the Space um, Missile Defense Center um, at uh, Cape Corn Huntsville, General Carbler, the commander. That is the Army component to General Dickinson. We have a Navy component uh, and a Marine component and an Air Force component. Our Air Force component is first Air Force. Uh, um, General Pierce there, Lieutenant General Pierce is actually dual hat. He has a number of hats he wears. He's also a comp air component to U.S. Northern Command, but he's also our Air Force component. So when we had our, our uh, commander's conference uh, a few weeks ago this fall in Colorado Springs, uh, we had all of those component commanders there in the room uh, talking about what they are bringing in, from their services. Uh, to the, uh, the, the U.S. Space Command mission set. And they all had things to, they all had things on that list. We needed all of them. So we were truly a joint command. It's why, we're, again, we're not a specified command, a true combatant command. Um, there, I think your question might be getting, a, your next, I think your question is also getting at, do we think that those service components, uh, how do they actually operate in terms of uh, being a uh, uh, giving orders as joint functional components like you would see in the other combatant commands. Um, we are actually looking at exactly how we would, how we would uh, um, uh, kind of transition the service component structure to a joint functional component structure. It's getting really doctrinal here for some in the audience. It's probably worth pointing out today, the way we started U.S. Space Command is we actually not only have all those service components that I described, and we've got all of them, all the services, we also have two uh, existing functional components that were there at the beginning of U.S. Space Command, and that is the uh, Combined Force Space Component Command out of Vandenberg uh, Space Force Base that Major General Dan Dana Burt commands, and Joint Task Force Space Defense in Colorado Springs that uh, Army Major General Tom James commands. We kind of stood up the command and we needed to be able to do mission right away, so we were executing war uh, operations day to day through those functional components we are looking at a way to make this look maybe more like other combat commands where we kind of normalize that and, and have service components also serving as functional components. I think that's another piece of your question you were getting at, but I need to put stomp the fact that we have service components today and we need all of them. Yes, and, and that was my question really. I mean, a service component, uh, personally, I always looked at them as my direct link into that service to uh, palm for the things or budget for the things that I needed as a warfighter. But I also needed the functional component to do planning and also to execute orders that were given from the combatant command at the operational level of war. And so that was really, the latter was really more of my question. And so uh, it, I, I understand now that that's kind of a next step for you. You have your functional component command for space is General Whiting at this point, but, uh, and also your service component. But then you're also looking to stand up um, an army uh, naval uh, functional components as well so that they can receive orders, do planning, cross integration with each other to meet your combatant commander needs. Is that correct, John? That's correct. That's all, again, that's all in work because we also don't, I mean, things are actually, we have, we're, we're able to do what we need to do today through the existing functional components of CIFSIC at Vandenberg and Joint Task Force Space Defense uh, at uh, Schriever Space Force Base. And so, um, uh, but uh, we are looking at how do we maybe look at this in the long term. Uh, again, if I, if I could lay out the story, we, we have, in two years, we have changed significantly. When we stood up two years and four months ago, and that was two jobs ago for me, I was in Colorado Springs working in a place called Air Force Space Command, if anyone remembers that organization. Um, and uh, and we, we kind of needed to get running, and we knew that we wanted to be, we had to do mission. And so those functional components we have today are what we stood up first. And then we've gradually added these service components and they are bringing terrific, bringing terrific value to the command. Um, you know, I, I guess I could, I could uh, uh, call, call out uh, Ross Myers, uh, Vice Admiral Ross Myers, who is our Navy space component commander and the, the uh, capabilities and linkages to the rest of the Navy that he now brings the same way you said, sir, when you were coming back, man, you need to have access into the service uh, his, is invaluable. That's why we have service components and why we need all service components from all the services within U.S. Space Command is truly a joint command and it always will be. That's, that's great, John. And you're right, uh, General Shaw, how quickly 
you've had to move over the last two years to get this stood up and and your vision uh, doctrinally sounds like it makes great sense uh, and it will be in line with every other combatant command, which is encouraging to hear. You know, when, when we talk about support and supporting, I, I think about it both at the COCOM level, but also at the operational level of war. And if I again could go back to a regional example, uh, you know, the land forces uh, need support many times from the air forces. A uh, classic example is close air support or maybe one way interdiction of second echelon and naval forces can support land forces and, and air forces can support naval forces with mining operations from the air, for example, harbor mining operations. Um, but for the air force to do any of those things for the other components, they first have to gain and maintain air superiority so that they have freedom of action to do those other mission sets and they're not distracted by the adversary. Uh, I was wondering if you could share your thoughts on, for you to be able to provide the enabling capabilities that you do today that are so critical to every other domain, whether it be GPS over the horizon comms or missile warning, your thoughts about how you would, how you would gain and maintain space superiority so you could continue to deliver those capabilities in support of um, the other combatant commands. So I, uh, again, a great question and a, and a uh, key focus area for us at U.S. Space Command. What's just a little different from the comparison that you made is, um, you know, air superiority can be relatively localized to that uh, geographic sure. AOR. You describe sure. it that way. That's why you have a, a JFAC or a CFAC within uh, a given combat command that has that mission set and needs to do that. Uh, Space superiority can't be locally localized to a terrestrial geographic AOR. It is within that overall space area of responsibility. And like I said, that relevant battle space is going to get uh, is going to get bigger as we as we go further. So absolutely right. So that is actually one of the primary missions of U.S. Space Command is to protect and defend our space capabilities against threats to ensure that we continue to deliver those to the joint warfighters that need them. Our method of modern war today within the Department of Defense relies on space. It's how we project power across the planet. It's how we do things. Um, uh, that's how we do precision targeting. It is how we do things at, at very, very high, uh, low latency uh, across the globe. We rely on space to do it. That is not uh, slowing down. That trajectory continues upward. And so we have to, main, we have to have build into our plans. How do we um, ensure that we continue to deliver those capabilities that if they are under attack, they degrade gracefully rather than all at once. And it's a huge responsibility. And that is our role. Um, uh, and for macro sense in a supporting role to other combat commands on the surface of the earth. But then I'll switch it right in order to do that. We may need other combat commands to be supporting the U.S. space command. And let me just give an example of, uh, uh, of, of what I mean by that. So if we've got a, a um, if there's a, uh, an adversary vessel at sea that is jamming uh, important C2 links in one of our satellites in the space AOR, um, is General Dickinson gonna, um, does, does he have the, you know, does he have the, uh, the, the uh, does he have opt-on or take-on of an asset to, uh, to do something about that ship? Probably not. Does the geographic combatant commander in whose AOR that enemy vessel uh, is, is conducting activity have the capability? Probably. So that becomes a supporting operation. Can you take care of that, uh, that problem for me? And I can, uh, I can multiply that example by many, many others on how we need to work together in a mutually supporting way among all the combatant commands in a global, in a global way. So, so the example I just gave, it may, we may be, we may be focused on an Indo-PACOM adversary and working operations along those lines. But the example I gave might not be in the Indo-PACOM uh, AOR on the globe. It might be in UCOMs or it might be in SOCOMs. And so we have to look at them from a global perspective and U.S. Space Command has the ability to do that globally. Terrific, thanks. That, that's a great description of that, I appreciate it. Hey, you know, uh, back when we worked together at STRATCOM, we thought a lot about deterrence and I, I know every, combatant commander thinks about deterrence. They want to deter warfare. And I think, and personally, I think that's our highest calling. The highest calling of our men and women in uniform is to deter warfare. 
uh, because, uh, and then when that fails, then to fight and win our nation's conflicts and settle them on terms beneficial to our country. Now, recently we've seen the, the Russians demonstrate a direct ascent ASAP capability. We know the Chinese have fielded a similar capability that holds our satellites at risk in all orbits, low earth orbit, medium, and geosynchronous. Uh, further, we've seen Russian satellites rendezvous with some of our most valuable and sensitive intelligence satellites in low earth orbit. And uh, most recently, the Chinese uh, demonstrated a fractional orbit of bombardment system that's coupled with a hypersonic glide vehicle, something that General Haydn described as a, uh, what appears to be a first strike weapon. And with all our adversaries pursuing all these war fighting capabilities in, from, and to space, what, what is U.S. Space Command doing to deter such a multi-layered set of threats that not only put, hold our space assets at risk, but now with the, the fractional orbital bombardment capability actually holds the homeland at risk? What, what are you thinking about? How do you, how do you deter them from either further fielding these capabilities or ever considering them, using them against U.S. forces and our allies? So we, we have to, uh, and, and this is a demand signal that General Dickinson is placing not only on the Space Force, but the other services, is we have to develop more resilient architectures against these. So I think it's, I think General Hyten actually used the term uh, big, bad, juicy targets to describe some of our legacy satellites that were built, built for efficiency, right? Um, I, the analogy I like to use is there are a lot of our satellites are uh, super tankers or mega container ships in space. They were designed, why do those exist in the maritime domain? For efficiency, you know, to deliver capability as efficiently as possible. Um, that's kind of how we built architectures in a benign domain. Um, but I don't know if I want to be on the bridge of a super tanker or trying to evade torpedoes. And so we have to uh, um, transition our architectures to be more resilient. I think there are ways to do that that probably involve proliferating platforms uh, and having not everything in one platform um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and leveraging commercial and leveraging allies and partners. Those are the initial steps that we need to take uh, along those lines. The uh, General Chen, let me, let me just a little bit. So there's a lot of talk about the, the, that Chinese test, the fractional orbit bombardment system that you mentioned that's been uh, talked about. And I still think there's not a, a good feeling for why that's kind of a, a different game changer. Um, an analogy I might propose is uh, just to how we, why, why it's kind of different um, and why we need to kind of realize that this is a, a, a potentially new strategic threat and, and why we need to kind of make sure we're prepared for it. Um, and the, the analogy might be flawed, but it's just a different way to think about it. So imagine we're, well, imagine you're watching a, a, a medieval battle of, of catapults hurling um, hurling their payloads at, at each other uh, on, on a big battlefield. And you're watching that, right? And you, you can see when, when, when one side launches it, you, you can pretty much, you can tell where it's going, right? And maybe even the other side kind of sees it coming and kind of can react to it um, and, and maybe try to protect their more, and, and knows where they're deployed and can, can kind of protect their capabilities. That's kind of like classic ballistic missiles, which is what the threat was during the Cold War and, and uh, and in many, in most cases, it's still the, the largest market share of strategic threats to us, although it's shrinking. But now imagine you're watching that battle and you see a catapult launch something. And then instead of just kind of following a trajectory, it kind of levels out. Uh, and then it just sort of seems like it's actually flying like an aircraft. And then maybe it even makes a turn or two and then drops. Um, that's kind of the difference. It's like, wait, this is different. How do we track this? How is, are we prepared to, to, to warn against this? Do we have the, the, the architectures we need to, to, to provide warning and maybe even engage it if we need to? That's kind of, kind of what we're looking at. And then you can take another step further and why does it have to come down right away, right? A fractional orbital bombardment system is just does less than an orbit. It gets into orbit and it's got it and it's different. It's not just purely ballistic anymore. It's, it's, it's free fall and then it has to deorbit when it wants to. But it could do multiple orbits. We call that a MOBS, multiple orbit bombardment system. So what if this thing launched a few laps around that battlefield and then came back? Okay. I offer that as an analogy to, to the viewers here, kind of why this is kind of different. And then we can extrapolate from that uh, why we need to be thinking about it as, a, as a another strategic component of another strategic threat to our nation and to our allies. 
No, I think it's a great description, and it, it is certainly one that uh, I think surprised the U.S., but best I can tell. Uh, it's one that the Russians or the Soviets toyed with back in the Cold War, and uh, we convinced them that that probably wasn't a good idea. It was destabilizing and also in violation of the space, Outer Space Treaty that we had signed, which said we wouldn't put nuclear weapons in orbit around the Earth. And so you're right, this is a new a new threat, uh, a new change in the strategic posture of China that uh, warrants attention from all combatant commands and certainly our Department of Defense. So thanks for describing that better. Um, I know there are flaws. There's probably a few few people out there writing down what they how they think I have their wrong. But the idea is that it's kind of not what you would expect and it's different and presents new challenges to us. It does. And I think one of the fundamental questions is why are the Chinese doing this? And uh, that's maybe perhaps for another session. Um, but, you know, I want to pull a thread on um, deterrence. Again, go back to that. I, and and I'll, I'll make a statement. You can agree or dis disagree with it. But I don't believe there's ever been a time in history where a purely defensive posture has deterred an adversary. Uh, a classic example, the Maginot Line. I don't think a castle was ever built so tall with walls so thick that an adversary didn't attempt to attack it or, and eventually succeed in one form or another. And just reading and listening to discussions about uh, what we're doing in the United States with regard to our space forces, I hear little discussion on offense. And, you know, um, as you well know, that to deter takes a demonstrated capability and will to hold at risk what an adversary values or fears uh, for the purpose of threatening either to uh, deliver unacceptable punishment or to make them believe that they can't accomplish their objectives. And um, I know the COCOM sets the requirements for what is needed to deter and the services provide those capabilities, the Space Force, for example. Here, here would be my great, greatest fear for our forces. Um, in spite of our efforts to field resilient forces, uh, the adversary continues to field offensive forces and takes away the key enablers that our joint forces have become dependent upon from space. And they, they present to us an unlevel playing field on the battlefield because they retain all their space capabilities because we have failed to hold them at risk with offensive capabilities. And that's a fight uh, I don't know that we can win and I, it's, but it's certainly a fight in which we will lose a lot of men and women, uniform men and women in, if our adversaries have space capabilities and we don't. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts on what the, how the COCOM is thinking about requirements for offensive capabilities to hold at risk our adversaries' GPS equivalent, our adversaries over the horizon complements, our adversaries' ISR uh, satellites that are meant to track our carriers at sea, our land forces, and our air forces. So, so we are absolutely talking about that. Let me let me start by kind of finishing a thread from our previous, uh, the previous question. Um, and that is, you know, our, our adversaries are developing counter space capabilities because they see the vulnerabilities in space that I described in our current architectures that were designed for benign domain. They see a vulnerability and that's why uh, they are building uh, capability to go after it, and so in a sense, that vulnerability is a is a is a source of uh, instability in the strategic environment. Right? So there, there's a there's a perceived opportunity, and then uh, to build capability against. It. So first of all, we we I just want to go back and finish Fred that uh, that you know, resilience and any other abilities we have that can protect and defend our space architectures that are either part of design of that architecture or other capabilities that we. Uh, add to that architecture that can help in protecting, defending, that reduce that vulnerability and therefore reduce that instability, contribute to deterrence, right? It's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's denial of benefits, right? That perceived benefit that that can be gained by taking out our capabilities. So I just want to say that piece of the equation is, is kind of how I'd summarize that. And then what you got after is, you know, our, our adversaries, China in particular, continue to develop their own space capabilities, not counter space, but space capabilities, just like you described, ISR, PNT, SATCOM, and such, and at an amazing rate. And so absolutely, we have to look at the ability to deny those capabilities um, to China uh, in order to impose a cost 
um, on them. And that is another piece of, of that overall deterrence equation. Uh, we are working hard on that with the, um, with the department um, and it is a, a focus area. Great, I think, again, I hear a reluctance to talk about it and I perhaps I understand it at this point, but as, as we learned from watching uh, Dr. Strangelove at some point, at some point to actively, de to effectively deter, the adversary must know what, what's at risk and what your, what your capabilities are and what you're willing to do. And uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more that uh, deterrence requires both uh, a strong defense, as, but it also requires a strong offense. And, um, and so I, I look forward in the future to hear more discussions on, on our thoughts, your thoughts about that and uh, what, how we're, how we're gonna proceed forward to make sure that an adversary like China will be confident in knowing that if they come after our space assets, they're not gonna be able to fight us with their space assets still, still in existence. Let me add a footnote to that and say that, you know, from this is how it should work, by the way, from US Space Command perspective, that, that, uh, that ability to counter Chinese space assets can come from any service. It's not this, just this, we shouldn't think the Space Force has to, should, can and should be the only service that can provide that. We want the entire Joint Warfighting Force to be able to help in that regard. And I gave an example earlier today, right? There might be an Army electronic warfare um, capability out there that we want to be able to use in a much, in a, in a broader campaign um, of, of, of denying space. And so I just stress that piece that it's not just Space Force. Absolutely, I think that's a great point to make. Uh, it, it takes the whole joint force to achieve ob objectives in anyone's AOR, and that would include your AOR as well. So that's a great point. Um, I think it was um, in a recent speech, um, you talked a little bit about maneuver warfare in space. And um, you know, Kepler has a, a say in maneuver warfare in space. Uh, I wonder if you might want to expand on, on your comments there and, and what, what, were, what were you thinking about when you, when you were talking about this, please? Yeah, sure. How many, I'm not how many hours we have left in our conversation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can get, uh, let, me, um, let me start by saying we, we really, we, uh, we are only at the beginning of really uh, formulating space warfighting doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean? Um, because and and, uh, and by the way, um, that doctrine formulation is not limited to U.S. Space Command leading joint space doctrine or Space Force doctrine. All the services, I think, are are will eventually have. Well, some do already, uh, but are going to continue to hone and build their space doctrine. Let me explain what I mean by that. So, and by the way, with the Mitchell Institute, this should be you know, should be a, a clear um, a paradigm to look at. The Air Force is not the only service that has air doctrine, right? There's an Army Field Manual on Army Aviation. There's a Marine uh, Warfighting publication on, 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 on air. Um, and so, and, and I, there is an Army publication already on space operations. I think they'll refine that. I think the other services, it's everybody's business because space is important to how we do joint warfighting across the entire joint force. Mm -hmm. Let me just say more, there's a breadth piece to this that is going to continue to, to grow across all organizations. Um, now, again, we get into the, the, the piece that's probably more Space Force focused, and that is how do we really think about um, how do we build doctrine to the next level within the space domain? We have a pretty remarkable document, I think, that was published last year, our, our Space uh, Capstone Doctrine or Space mm -hmm. Force Capstone Doctrine document. You know, maybe we should have named it. Uh, so capstone is usually something you put on the top of a structure, right? It's like the top. We probably should have named it something like first stage, right? Uh, and, and good rocketry, um, a good rocket metaphor there. It was. It's really just kind of getting us off the pad, getting us going, building that momentum upon which we can now we can now really get going. Um, that's kind of what it was, and it has some terrific ideas in there. The idea that we're linked to uh, that our our that space power is linked to um, uh, economic activity uh, and opportunities um, that you have to treat it in, in a global perspective, as we kind of talked about earlier, you can't regionalize on the terrestrial, um, uh, in the terrestrial spheres uh, space. But uh, where do we go from here? 
And we try to use analogies all the time, each of which are helpful, but also are not complete. Uh, you know, we, we sometimes talk about in sort of, I would say, army-like term space is the high ground. Well, sort of, but not exactly. You know, you learn in your first uh, year astronautics course that, uh, you know, moving from circular Mio to circular Geo takes the same energy to move from circular Geo down to circular Mio. It's not easier to move down. It takes the same amount of energy. It's really about energy within a gravity well. Um, we tend to, some others would look at it from sort of a Navy, naval or maritime perspective. I've, I'm guilty of this. I've done this a bit in some of the writings I've done. Um, or think about in terms of control over a, over a, over a commons of source. But that doesn't really work perfectly well either because of the three-dimensional nature um, of, the, of the domain. And then in air, right? We, I mean, we sometimes will think about it's an extension of the air domain. Yeah, but not, not exactly. Um, you know, you, you've got uh, um, constant energy orbits that allow platforms to stay on orbit for, uh, for years. We don't really see that in the air domain. Right? It's just not, it's all different. And I would give this hypothesis. I would say the, this doctrine that will eventually derive in the space domain that is derived from the physics of that domain is more different from all of the other domains than these domains are different from each other. I mean, it's just a hypothesis I would put out there. It's just not as intuitive. It's just a different, a different um, uh, environment altogether. So where am I going with this? So how do we think about how do we think about that? Then what's the next level of doctrine? How do we talk about, as you mentioned, space superiority or space control or space denial operations? How do we think about maneuver in that domain? You, you know, again, you know, satellites in orbits are actually the best analogy. They are is actually they're as you said earlier, they're like. They're like castles. I mean, that's actually the, 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 we can predict where they're going to be. They're actually static in the space domain, even though they're moving physically. It's when maneuver happens in your energy uh, configuration changes and how rapidly are you doing that and in what directions um, where we really start to talk about um, maneuver. And that makes things more difficult to track in the space domain. It uh, provides more uncertainty for an adversary. How do we develop that doctrine? So that was a pretty long answer to your question. But what I'm trying to build here is realize that we are just beginning to explore that. There's some great thinking, by the way. I'm sure there are a lot of students out there that have seen very great, great thinking over the past 20 to even 30 years about what would space warfighting doctrine look like. Um, and those are going to be shoulders that will stand on moving forward. But, but we got to keep moving forward. You know, uh, Mitchell and Duhay and, and Sherman, not the, not the Civil War general, but the air power theorist, had some great ideas that then we built upon in the air legacy to get really after what we needed to and how we do war fighting the air domain. We're going to do the same in the space domain. That's terrific. Thanks. Um, I've, I've always said that the coin of the realm in space is Delta V, um, which, you know, to our listeners, that means that uh, your ability to change your speed and maneuver. And uh, that's a function typically of how much fuel you have on board. And, it, and it's, and as we go into the future, do you see, uh, uh, is there a demand function out there for more maneuverable satellites and maybe new ways to provide propulsion uh, to include, you know, nearly unlimited propulsion in, in the form of uh, nuclear power propulsion in space, et cetera? I, I like to point out that we, we are, we, so really any form, aside from some really fringe cases that might involve uh, solar wind or, or aerodynamic uh, breaking through atmosphere, very, very edge cases, everything we do in space by maneuver is Newton's third law, right? It's the ejection of mass to gain, um, as you said, uh, delta V. Um, and that's almost like the age of sail, which went for like 2000 years, right? It, we were kind of trapped in that. There were better ways to do it, more efficient, but it was sort of something you were stuck in, are, are we gonna eventually emerge from that uh, with some new technology that um, really changes the game? I'm excited about uh, any ideas along those lines. Uh, that's terrific. Well, we're coming up on uh, the end of our, uh, your or my you know, solo discussions here, or one-on-ones, and we're gonna open up um, the forum now to Q, Q and A. I, I see we have 193 participants, which is terrific. I wanna welcome everyone who's joined us again today. Uh, but I'm going to um, use the host's uh, privilege here to ask the first question in the open forum and, and probably my last question for the day. And I, you know, General Shaw, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, the 
your views on the importance of combined operations in this domain and uh, the benefit that the U.S. might garner from the close alliances we have as opposed to some of our most uh, concerning adversaries who have few allies. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you gave me the opportunity because that is important. I did mention a little bit earlier about how we have to grow our, our integration um, as, a, as both a command and a service. Uh, I, here, here's an interesting um, couple facts is that kind of are, are the foundation of this discussion. The first is um, when we, and you, first of all, uh, you know, most geographic combat commands, when they think about international engagement, it's the allies in their area of responsibility, which is a, a, a subset of the globe. When we look out and look at allies and partners that uh, we could possibly engage with, it's the whole world. Right? So that may seem trivial, but it's worth pointing out. Everybody is a potential partner in space. And the second is anyone we do reach out to seems interested in space. I haven't, we haven't found a nation yet that's not interested in space. And so when you put those two together, that starts to build tremendous potential for partnerships and engagement uh, with, with not only our, our, our long traditional allies, but perhaps new relationships with new nations. So um, there's really you know, almost no limit when it comes to that. Um, we have made great progress in, I, I don't even know when to go back and start the clock. I could go back to the beginning of, of my career or maybe the last uh, five to eight years, but we have made great progress at bringing on more allies and partners into um, our uh, architectures, our operations. Um, and we continue to, to and, and when we continue to do that, uh, just recently in the last couple of years, we, you know, it used to be just our Operation Olympic Defender, which is our day-to-day -day operation that we do at U.S. Space Command. It actually traces back to when we were part of U.S. Strategic Command. I think even when you were the commander, so I think we had we had that operation. That was just a U.S. only operation for the longest time. And we now have multiple partners that are part of that operation, and we may add more in the future. So that's just bringing things to another level. Um, we haven't so I can't believe we've made it through 47 minutes. We haven't talked about classification. <laughs> One of the big issues out on the, on the, um, out in the space discourse, and I probably should have brought it up sooner, but we, we continue to beat the drum on getting, opening up our traditionally overly restrictive classification of our space capabilities so we can talk to more allies and partners and, and bring them in. And that, by, by the way, has a reciprocal brand benefit from their end on, on them talking more with us. And so I could I can continue to talk about this, but these there are opportunities across uh, across the world for us um, to enhance our um, our partnerships with others. I guess I'll I'll cap it off by saying, you know the uh, the interim um, national strategic guidance that we got from the president earlier this year talked about you know how do we uh, reinforce the the rules based international order. Um, well, you know. A lot of what we've talked about in terms of uh, norms of responsible behavior in space as we go forward is an extension of that rules-based international order. And I think we will have a lot of nations that are interested in aligned with us along those lines as we go forward. Great, thank you. Um, Lucas is gonna help us out here and, um, and bring people up for, from the uh, participants here to ask questions. So Lucas, over to you. Thank you, sir. So we uh, first question here is from uh, Mark Shackelford. He says, uh, General Shaw, you mentioned the expanding AOR of U.S. Space Command. Can you please give us your thoughts on how we'll achieve space domain awareness as we move out into cislunar space? Yeah, um, so again, another topic that amazing we didn't hit on. There's so much to talk about. I have to do this again. Um, please, please. Yeah. Do. So, um, the, so uh, really, General Dickinson's number one priority for the command um, actually is space domain awareness. You might say, wait a minute, why isn't it protect and defend like you were talking about with General Chilton or why isn't it um, something else? Well, because you can't do any of those things if you don't understand what's happening in space. And as it turns out, um, you know, if everybody, uh, uh, if, if, ever, if, if everybody operating in space was transparent and they operated predictably, mostly stayed in their normal orbits, which remember uh, from an astrodynamics perspective were relatively static conditions, right? Because you can predict where things are going to be. Um, then uh, that would be, it would make our job a lot easier. But when actors are not doing that, it makes it challenging. And that's exactly the sort of thing we would face when we are under attack in the space domain. So we need to understand uh, what's going on, where threats are coming from, 
and how those threats are evolving in real time. And that's a challenge for us. Uh, you, I wanna, uh, thanks Mark for the question. As it is inevitable that we will continue our relevant battle space, which, you know, in a benign domain, we, it, if we had to talk about the relevant space that we looked at, it really was geo and below. It was rare that we really looked at anything higher up in the gravity well. But uh, we expect that there will be more and more activity further and further out. And we want to anticipate that and be able to understand what's going on there. I, I would also say, I, I think I remember back in the Space Symposium in August that uh, um, Administrator Nelson of NASA uh, pointed out that as NASA proceeds with its Artemis program and bringing uh, Americans and, and our allies back to the moon, that he would like to do that in a safe and transparent way. Uh, in a secure way. And I think the uh, U.S. Space Command, since that's their AOR, can be a partner and support NASA in that regard and having good awareness out to the lunar sphere. So um, we're always eager to find uh, ideas on how we can do that better. Thanks, Mark. Great. Our uh, next question comes from uh, Chris Shank. He says, uh, great discussion of uh, in-space warfare. How does Space Command look to leverage commercial space capabilities, especially imagery, for putting competitors' terrestrial capabilities at risk? Do you consider this a role primarily for other COCOMs to leverage or Space Command? Oh, so it's absolutely Space Command, Chris. Thanks for asking the question. Um, and again, uh, I'm glad you, glad you brought the question. Uh, our partnerships don't, are not limited to um, other elements of the Department of Defense or the government or our, or our government allies and partners. It is the commercial sector as well. And I guess why I would expand that by uh, by a transit property that includes the commercial capabilities that our allies can bring to bear from their perspective nations as well. Yeah, we're all in this together. And a lot of the cutting edge capabilities that we see today in the space domain, you know, it used to be in the Cold War, it was all government, right? The government had the cutting edge. But now there's so much economic opportunity in the space domain that many commercial companies actually have some of the cutting edge technologies. And that ranges anything from what we've seen SpaceX do with reusable launch to abilities to monitor SATCOM networks that our commercial providers do an exceptional job of doing. That includes identifying and localizing uh, um, uh, interference um, and to the ISR uh, arena, uh, which I think, Chris, you're probably alluding mostly to. So um, we, we start by realizing we can't do it the old way and just look to the traditional aerospace industry um, uh, members to provide capability in the space domain. We want to look to all possible um, sources of capability and work together. Great. Uh, the next question is from John Bennett. He says, uh, what does the department need to do to achieve the ability to fight SATCOM? Is there an expectation within U.S. SpaceCom to achieve a multi-orbit, multi-band enterprise architecture made of the appropriate mix of MILSAT and COMSAT with geo, MEO, LEO capabilities? Yeah, I, I could answer that a lot of ways. The first I would say is, you know, U.S. Space Command will, will what we want is to be able to, um, no matter how those services are uh, integrated into um, COM architectures that support joint war fighters on the earth, because those are primarily the customers of that, right? We want to be able to uh, uh, protect and defend those capabilities and uh, characterize any threats against those capabilities as quickly as we possibly can. So I think where the commercial world is heading with uh, proliferated LEO architectures and alternative forms from the traditional large satellite at GEO are automatically contributing to a, in a good way, to our, to US Space Command's ability to protect and defend and, and build in resilience for the joint warfighter on the ground and the, the user on the ground, whether it could be a civilian user. Um, so those are all heading in the right direction. Uh, where we would maybe steer that is how do we partner? How do we talk about those architectures in ways that um, give us good um, collaborative insight into what's happening across those networks and integrating them as effectively as we can? Great. So the next question comes from uh, Brian Wheaton. He says, uh, the shift towards more resilience uh, architectures dates back to the uh, 2011 National Security Space Strategy, but the implementation has been slow. Uh, can you talk about how the Space Force is accelerating that implementation? Uh, so, that, you know, really, a really question for Space Force, other than, but what I can tell you is that U.S. Space Command uh, is constantly applying a demand signal of, I need, I need to have more resilient architectures um, 
in order to be able to sustain capability to a joint warfighter as a conflict, as a crisis and a conflict unfolds so that we don't lose it all at once. Um, I would also add that the more resilient your architectures are, by the way, we, you know, I noticed that we didn't actually try to define resilience here today, even though we used it quite a bit, right? Is it strictly a passive uh, quality that's built into a, an architecture um, by virtue of, of either being pro proliferated or hard to get at or, or such? Um, or is it a wider definition that includes our ability to maybe actively protect and defend it with certain capabilities? Uh, we can talk about that. By the way, we shouldn't forget uh, that cyber is a key component of that resilience as well, because that is a significant threat vector. Um, so U.S. Space Command will continue to be demanding in that regard. How is this architecture going to, uh, how am I going to be able to uh, do my mission to make sure that I keep that space capability floating, flowing to the joint warfighter in a, in a conflict? Great. Some, a bit more of a logistical question, but uh, when will U.S. Space Command achieve FOC and what will that entail? Yeah, um, I think uh, that is going to be linked ultimately to where our uh, headquarters ultimately goes. And that is something that's uh, ongoing above the command's level right now, where, where our final permanent headquarters location will be. Great, maybe uh, time for one last question here from uh, Brian Plummer. He says, uh, what is the value of obtaining and analyzing publicly available information that can help capture the not only the potential threats, but provide a pulse check on our partner and allies or potential yeah. actions? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. And we have it right at the end of our day. Um, why I say that's great is I, what you're talking, so let me, let's just talk about space domain awareness, right? Uh, space domain awareness is a, uh, is a good classic big data problem. There is plenty of data out there about what's going up on space because there are so many sensors, there are so many humans uh, looking up into space, um, uh, and uh, there's an awful lot that you can observe uh, from the planet um, uh, of what's going on there. So how do we actually get our arms around all of that data and process it, use the right kinds of analytics as any would with any big data problem in low latency timelines to really understand what's happening and then be able to take action on that. And I don't think we, we should never think we have cast the net far enough on incorporating all that data. So absolutely. And by the way, you know, I got another facet of big data is there may be second or third order things that you have access to that give you an indication, right? So it may not be looking out at what's happening in space. It might be looking at something that's happening terrestrially you have awareness of that and it feeds into an analytic that says, if that's happening there, then this must be happening in space. So I, I guess I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll wrap that up by saying space domain awareness is a big data problem. We need the cutting edge tools uh, uh, available to us to do that mission. Lucas, I think we can squeeze in one more and then we'll have to wrap. Great, so we have a question from Joe uh, with Saki. He says, uh, much has been written and spoken about the imperative for implementing norms of behavior in space. Uh, we have many allies on board. Uh, what steps are being taken to achieve agreements with Russia and China to come to agreement on the subject? Is there any hope for any real progress here? Yeah, so, so let me, hey, Joe, appreciate the question. Let me just say a couple of things on, on that, that, that are antecedent, I think, to your question about getting to Russia and China. So uh, the first is, uh, I hope everybody's aware the Secretary of Defense signed a memo earlier, earlier, earlier this year that established five recommended tenets of responsible behavior. This is a memo that's available. It's available on the U.S. Space Command website, so you can come get it there if you haven't seen the memo I'm talking about. But the very last paragraph of that memo, it said U.S. Space Command will now will go and work on how do we implement these tenets of responsible behavior. Kind of remarkable that the Secretary of Defense is putting out a memo like this. It's basically saying, hey, we're operating in this domain just like everybody else, and we want to operate in a responsible manner, the same way the United States Navy it operates on a responsible manner on the high seas and so on. Um, the next piece to that is, um, before you get to Russia and China, I would say, hey, I think, back to what I said before, almost every nation we talk to is interested in space, and almost every nation we would talk to also would like to have responsible behavior in space. It's just helpful for the entire world. Um, it incentivizes economic behavior. It makes the space domain uh, safer and more transparent. And so I think uh, we, will, we will grow it outward like that and get a, 
uh, it's an international problem, not just a bilateral Russia, China, United States problem about how do we grow these? How do we agree to these? And um, eventually I think we want Russia and China to be part of that as well. Well, sadly we've run out of time here in General Shaw and uh, you're right, this could go on uh, for many more hours. And I, I, we will take you up on your offer to be invited back. And I hope next time uh, you and I will be in the same, at least state, if not the same room when we have this conversation. Uh, thank you so much for taking time to join us today. And again, thank you to our participants who, who logged in. I hope this was a benefit to you. I know it was to me personally. So Godspeed, uh, General Shaw, to both you personally and to U.S. Space Command. Well, thanks, sir. And thanks to Mitchell Institute. I, I guess uh, for, for the viewers haven't figured it out yet, even though I, my, I live in Colorado Springs and that's where U.S. Space Command is, is currently uh, headquartered. I'm, I'm here at the Mitchell Institute in D.C. Had a great week in D.C. doing a number of things, but headed headed back to Colorado uh, this weekend. Hopefully, um, maybe I'll run into a snowstorm on my way back. That'd be nice. Let's hope <laughs> for that. <laughs> Cheers. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye now.